Israel must know now that they are going to have to go this alone. They're going to have to go this alone. So if if there is a straw that's going to break the camel's back, if there's a, a spark that's going to light the fire, the Middle East is a great place to do it. And then what that does, Eric, is it causes all these other touch points that I mentioned to light up, okay? And now's the time to take advantage of the United States of America. Folks, welcome back. I promised you I'd have as my guest today, uh, General Michael Flynn. Promises made, promises kept. General Flynn, what a great honor, finally, uh, to have you on this program. God bless you for all you have done. And again, thank you for being with us today. I want to talk to you about everything. Where do we begin? Wow. Well, first of all, Eric, thanks so much for your patience and to your audience, your great audience and uh, and your team for uh, for getting me back on here. It's a really it's, this is a this is an incredibly important time for this country. And I, I think for me, what uh, I, what I've been dealing with for the last couple of days with various conversations with people from from Washington, D.C. to uh, some folks that I know overseas is is what's happening specifically what's happening in Israel, but more generally what's happening around the globe as it as it relates to the real serious potential of a World War III uh, with the, you know, with the, everything happening in Eastern Europe and uh, between Ukraine and Russia, what we now see with the Chinese and their operations over in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, as well as what the Chinese are doing in uh, in uh, sort of economic and political uh, alliances and, and dalliances. And then, of course, um, you know, specifically uh, back in Israel, I think that what's happening in the Middle East is a indicator. And I think about indicators and warnings as a as a as a long time intelligence professional you know, looking at the world and looking at, at the kinds of things that I was responsible for to to at least, uh, uh, you know, provide information on to up to and including presidents, you know. I, I want to be clear with with my audience in case anybody's not tracking they're they're new to this or they're new to you. Yeah. Uh, y- your career culminated. You were the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, right. the nation's highest serving military intelligence officer. If anyone knows what they're talking about on these issues, I'm sorry to say it's you. I'm sorry to say it's you because you're telling us things that are disturbing. I know that you're a man of faith. Uh, I met you, I don't expect you to remember this, but it was uh, a few hours before President Trump was inaugurated in 2016. We were in the church. Uh, There's the traditional church service immediately before the inauguration, where the president comes. President Carter uh, was in the room. Many others were in the room. I had the privilege during that extraordinary service of sitting next to you during that time. Obviously, neither of us had any idea of what lay ahead for the country, particularly for you. If you don't mind, for those unfamiliar with your story because this your story is so seminal it's not just your yeah. story it's the story of what happened to america tell us if you don't mind refresh my audience in terms of what happened to you because as i see it at least the the, the short version is that you were effectively deputized by god uh and uh huh. by the president of the united states to do the right thing with regard to what we now call the deep state. You knew where the bodies were buried. They came after you like crazy. My guess is Trump didn't see it coming. And before it was, uh, well, uh, what happened was you were ousted uh, in a way that was the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of uh, how we get to where we are today. Yeah. You know, and if you think about, you know, to put it in sort of biblical terms, because I, I, I lived in the, you know, the valley of the shadow of death. Right. I mean, Psalm 23. And I think when you say the beginning of sorrows, you know, that moment, that, and which is a very historic moment for the country. I, 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 I firmly believe, Eric, that that uh, that me depart my departure. And I, I don't say this loosely at all or, or uh, without great humility 
But my departure from the White House changed the course of history for the United States of America. Uh, and, and to me personally, I, that is, that is the, the moment that I entered, you know, Psalm 23 uh, to be, to be uh, you know, faith-based about this because I lived in that, in that uh, valley of the shadow of death. You know, and the, and the other part of that phrase, that that sort of idea is, you know, but, you know, fe- well, I will fear no evil because thou art with me, you know. And, and that took me a while to to come to grips with that because I, I was really, you know, I was I was questioning everything after after my departure. But but prior to my departure, yeah, there was I mean, up to and including the 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 former president or the president of the United States at that time, Barack Obama, actually told President Trump in the transition for the entirety of the United States of America, told President Trump, you know, not to hire me. And and yet Barack Obama twice, Eric, hired me to be not only the, the assistant director of national intelligence in one uh, role, but also to be the head of the of the Defense Intelligence Agency. So he hired me twice to do that. Okay, he, he both, hired you twice because he thought you could be flipped or you could be kept on their side of things. Yeah. And when they saw who you were, they decided right. you needed to be gotten rid of quickly. Exactly. And then, you know, and then sort of the, the insurance policy kicked in. And for those people that really want to follow uh, you know, on my various social media, or they can go to generalflynn.com. I have it posted. I, you know, I filed I filed a a lawsuit against the Department of Justice recently, Eric, about a month ago, and it's a story that that lawsuit. It's not just a lawsuit, and, and it's really you know there's a, there's the money side of it and all that, but that's that's less important. I filed a lawsuit that tells a story about all of this, and it really goes into not just the you know, the 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 specifics, but it goes into the, the the strategic overview of why what what it was that they were so afraid of. And I I've learned this phrase, Eric, that, uh, you know, when, it, when you're talking about good versus evil, because that's really what this is all about in, in our what's going on in our country today. Evil, evil fears what they cannot control. And I wasn't a, I wasn't somebody who was, you know, bought and paid for. It wasn't a compromised military officer. I was an officer that rarely, actually, rarely served in Washington, D.C. I'd, I'd spent five years of my life in, in various combat operations from Central America, the, the Caribbean, and places like Haiti. And, uh, and then, of course, in the Middle East and Central Asia, I'd, I'd been, I'd, I'd been you know, in environments over in Europe. I've been environments over in the Pacific, in Korea, in Japan. So, so my, my wealth of experience was really it was military. It was certainly the the intelligence community, all the way up to the highest levels of the intelligence community, and and we can go into some detail if if you think your audience is is, is um, you know would would like to hear some of that because it's important I think. But now I'm going into the political uh, battle, the political warfare, right? And political warfare in our country has completely changed. This is no longer about Republicans wanting little government and Democrats wanting big government. Now we're talking about a complete shift of our ideology from essentially a, a constitutional republic with uh, with capitalism as part of our essence to an American form of socialism, you know, with a happy face, right? Where, where that that's that's one of the bigger that's one of the biggest lies. Well, that's and the, that's putting it nicely, frankly. It's it's really going it more very, toward a Chinese form of authoritarian uh, uh, state control with not such a happy face. It's become exactly. it's become dramatically dark very quickly. Uh, exactly. That they were pretending as long as they could pretend that it was kind of a happy socialism like Sweden or something like that. And but we've pretty quickly seen where it actually goes because let's put it clear, let's, let's make it clear, Tr- Trump uh, inadvertently, as far as I'm concerned, uh, showed them for who they are, uh, his simple presence, uh, his bringing in people like you scared them to death, caused them to yep. behave dramatically, desperately, and to out themselves as fundamentally anti-American, atheistic, pro-China, communistic, whatever you want to call it, in a way yep. that they'd never done before. Let's be honest. Uh, yep. You know, Obama was not advertising yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that side that's of right. things. I think what happened was they, you know, the 
the Democratic Party, the Democratic machine, the left, they firmly believed that Hillary Clinton was going to be hands down the winner of the 2016 election. And, and you know, lo and behold, Donald Trump wins. So when that happened, the, the entire their entire methodology and plan, their strategic plan to basically move the country down a different path, which is down this path towards communism, changed. And it changed because Donald Trump got in the way. And I think your your word is is precisely chosen and wise, which is in in a inadvertent. So in an inadvertent way, he he got in the way. And so now all of a sudden, you know, the the drain the swamp, right? Drain the swamp. That really wasn't something that Donald Trump came up with. That that actually came from the campaign and it came from the audiences that he was talking to because people looked at Washington, D.C. as this, you know, as this very corrupt bastion of what I, you know, what we now call the uniparty. And it's just, it really is corrupt. And I, I think that, you know, for Donald Trump, he was not as savvy about the ways of Washington, D.C. I mean, the guy had only been there probably less than nine or 10 times in his life. I mean, look, let's right? be honest. No one was particularly savvy about right. this. I mean, I was completely deluded or thought, well, there's some truth to it. It wasn't until the advent of Trump that this blew right. up and that we basically flushed the birds from the bushes and we kind of saw, oh, we didn't know what we had. Now we see right. it and it's now it's open warfare effectively. Yeah, it is open warfare and it's open. It's open ideological warfare. And, you know, I call it I call it fifth generation warfare. It's a war of narratives. You know, it's a combination of, of hybrid, unrestricted, um, you know, irregular, if you want to use those types of words for people that want to go look those up. And, and I've written a book about that, you know, the Citizen's Guide to Fifth Generation Warfare. And that's kind of what we're, where we're at right here at home. So that's the fifth generation warfare component of it, because it's a it's a mix of this war of narratives that is a that is a complete shift. These are tectonic shifts domestically about the direction that our country, uh, that people in our country want to take us ideologically, politically, right? Sociologically, culturally, in order to change, you know, if you're, you know, I've, I've led big organizations uh, up to and including organizations with as many as 20,000 people, you know, from a platoon of, of, of 45 to, to the Defense Intelligence Agency of 20,000. And whenever you want to affect an organization, you have to understand its culture, and then you have to try to change its culture. Well, the, the left has really been working hard on, the, on this cultural shift of America for a long time. And, you know, one of those areas is in the education system, right? I mean, you know, we can, we can have an entire series of shows on the education system, well, Eric. But I look, I, wanna, I, I already want to have you back. This is what happens. Like, I'm thinking to myself— there's so much I want to talk to you about that you're uniquely positioned to speak on. And so, I, I mean, I want to respect your time today, but this yeah. is very, very, very important, uh, everything yeah. we're talking about. What, what you just said, I mean, we're talking about background, but what you just said about where we are today, um, m many people have said this, but it seems that if a group of people had gotten control of the country whether by stealing an election or by fooling people into voting, doesn't matter. Although, just, you know, if you're keeping score right. at home, it was stolen. But the point is, if they got the control and then said, okay, our goal is to destroy the nation uh, as quickly as possible, nothing could really compare to what has happened in the short term of the Biden administration. We could go chapter and verse ultra disaster after disaster yeah. things that we could never dream of happening are happening when we come back i'm talking to general michael flynn don't go away all right you said you wanted to talk about where we are domestically go ahead yeah so domestically you know there's a there is a a so for people to understand the critical components of the u.s government when we think about the house of representatives and the senate and all these other things there's actually other institutions of the bureaucracy that control much of the levers of real power. One of them, you know, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex. JFK only a few years later started to tell, you know, he started to really warn us about the, you know, these, this intelligence system that was, that was rearing its ugly head. And of course we know what happened to JFK. 
But what has happened? I mean, look, we're not we're not joking. This is the deep, what we call the deep state today. Yeah. Deeply yeah, so nefarious. Which so is Derek, to say, these are two presidents that warned us. That's right. So I, I mean, I, I have such deep knowledge of the history of some of this. So let's fast forward to to the last couple of years when we talk about the deep state and what's happening domestically. What we have, we have the the entirety of the intelligence community, which has really grown in such an extraordinary way, frankly, since 9/11. And and, and there's a lot a lot there, but it's grown and it's and it's over. It's overreaching now into the lives of everyday citizens. Well, That's look, and, and, and I want to be clear, and a lot of stupid conservatives like Eric Metaxas cheered this on, utterly yeah. oblivious right. uh, to, to, to what was happening. And of course, so I, now, by God's grace, repenting of that foolishness. But yeah. that's exactly what happened. This, I saw some of this as I was leaving the military. As I was coming into the, the last couple of years of my career, I'm, I'm now at those levels. And I'm like going, wait a second, folks, this is not how we're supposed to function. And, you know, as a military guy, I'm answering to the commander in chief, you know, and I'm and I'm pushing back. But they, they didn't they didn't always like that. But, you know, and I ended up I ended up leaving the military. That's OK. When I but now now we have the intelligence community, we have the Department of Justice. Right. And the Department of Justice is another massive lever lever of power because a lot of people don't know the FBI is not some independent organization. The the director of the FBI works for the attorney general who works for the president of the United States. So the FBI is actually a subordinate organization to the Department of Justice. So that lever of power is the rule of law in this country. Yes, that is a big deal. So if they decide to come and knock on your door, Eric, or come and knock on my door for any reason under God's green earth, they can. And then they can say, you know, we're going to come in and search your home and we're going to take you in for questioning and they can do it. And they can do it now for national security reasons, right? They don't even have to tell you what the reasons are. They just bring you in. That's the, that's the second part. So intelligence community, the, the, the rule of law institutions, the Department of Justice, the FBI. And then the third part is the White House itself. So the White House, and one of the places where I was, I was going to change was I was going to change the structure of the national security system, right? The National Security Council to start with had close to 500 people at the height of the of the war against Russia when Russia was the Soviet Union and we it was the Warsaw Pact versus the West at the height the National Security Council had about 45 people when I took over we had close to 500 it's totally unnecessary so the white house is also consumed by elements of this deep state particularly those two two that I mentioned those two components that I mentioned and that's a very dangerous thing because Really, what you don't want to do is you don't want to limit the information going to the president of the United States. So if you if you have a big structure inside the White House, which we do, and frankly, to, ma- to name a name, Susan Rice is still back in the White House. She's still running the, the she's sort of the engineer running the trains every day. You know, I, I, I mean, that's I don't that's remember. Fa- did did the American people uh, did they did they elect <coughs> Susan Rice, we'll put a pin in it, and when we come back at the beginning of hour two, we'll answer that question, parentheses, no. You just said Susan Rice uh, is running things at the White House in the Biden administration today. She was not elected. She's not elected. She's the National Security Advisor for Homeland Security. I can tell you that nothing goes, nothing comes out of the White House unless she puts her stamp on it. And so you wonder, and she's not really, you know, she'll say, She's working for the president and, and the vice president, but not really. These are people that are working. There's a there's an apparatus above the above the White House that's that's sort of running the show right now. And these this is this. It's unconstitutional. That, you need to say that this is unconstitutional. Very, this is criminal, and that is what so is happening right now. Yeah, and it's so extraordinary and so corrupt, but yet it's happening. And I want the American people. I want your audience to understand that this is not a conspiracy. Theory that this is real. Uh, no, no, our country is going in the wrong direction. So, so part of this is that there is also th- there's also this infiltration going on in our country. Okay, and and I could go into a lot on that, but the the main infiltrator is China. Okay, is the Chinese Communist Party, and they've been infiltrating into our into our society for decades. And through through various institutions, through the institution of government, institution of education, institution of business and, and, and our economy, 
And that's been happening for at least 30 to okay, 40 years. Okay, and this years. is a long-term plan <laughs> Very to long take term. America China. down as the leading yeah. power in the world. They've Eric, been working Eric on it China. for decades, and here we are. Yeah, for your audience, China has had a 100-year plan under, and, and Mao Zedong is the one that originated it. And the 100-year plan essentially made this century, because they knew that the last century was going to be the American century. China planned for 100 years, you know, then, and we're in the middle of it. In fact, it's it's been it's been moving faster because because uh, President Xi appointing himself for you know basically the premier for life, right? So China has mo- has moved up their plan quite a bit, and now they're gonna they're gonna move to to taking over the global dominance this decade, not just this century, but this decade. So now, when we now let's just jump to. How is that happening? Where where are these touch points occurring? So we have physical things going out in the Pacific. We just had one of the largest, uh, you know, quote unquote, training exercises out around the island of Taiwan. And basically the Taiwan Minister of Defense said we are now ready to to take over Taiwan. I mean, he just said it in like the last 48 hours. If Joe Biden were president and you were the the head of China, you would be insane not to take over Taiwan. Exactly. I mean, so so they know that they're they have nothing to fear from this administration. Part of it is because there's not only weakness in this administration and there's weakness in our military, sadly, but there's also a there's a collusion between this administration and China. Yeah. The word you're looking for is corruption. Yeah, so that's so, so that's one geo strategic piece. That's a big piece. And now let's jump over to to Europe, to Eastern Europe, where we have Ukraine and and we're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars on on a place where where this this White House has yet to say here are our very clear objectives as to why we're doing this. Hasn't happened. And and we're also talking about nuclear weapons. Even even uh, uh, Biden has mentioned the word nuclear and talked about nuclear weapons. I mean, we've never had this kind of conversation. So that's another big geostrategic, uh, uh, you know, touch point. Now, within that touch point, China's prime minister, Xi, has just been over there, cut a deal with uh, with Putin, largest economic and largest military deal in their history. And China now is playing peacemaker. Right. So China is going going to solve the war in in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Trust me. I mean, I, I don't say that loosely. China will end up solving it. China just had Macron from from France over in uh, visiting in China. And Macron comes out and says some really, I I think, some very nasty things, politically nasty things about what the U.S. should or should not do, what the Biden administration should or should not do. You kind of go, wow. I mean, this is France right now. We've always joked about how the French roll over whenever, whenever the pressure's on. But, you know, the French people, I've I've fought with the French military with them side by side. And they're, that's a good military organization. I know many in the intelligence community. They're good people. They're being led poorly. And for Macron, and I, I mean, he, he just said this over the weekend, Eric. So this is not something that, again, is, is conspiracy. And then you have China cutting a deal between the Saudis and Iran to have a peace deal, okay, which is unheard of in the annals of the Middle East. And China was right in the middle of, of organizing a peace deal. And that, so that's a that's a, that's subsets of a second big strategic piece. So you got China, Taiwan, Eastern Europe, and some of these other pieces that China is involved in. And now you have Israel. Israel is under direct assault. They have a problem internal. They got a domestic. They have a domestic insurgency going on, and they know that. I listened to uh, a good friend of mine, Ambassador Ron Dermer, who was the U.S. ambassador to the United States. I don't know if you ever had a chance to meet him. He's a terrific guy. He's like. He's, the, he's a, a minister of like strategic communications over there now. He's a terrific, terrific leader. And I, and I listened to him uh, overnight in, a, in an interview. And, and Israel has a six front war. So we and those in our White House, back to tying the domestic issues in our White House together, those in our White House are for Palestine. OK, are for Palestine. So they want they want the Palestinians to to rise up in, in many ways. Israel is under direct threat. And what I said to a, a very close friend of mine this morning, and I'll share it with your audience, Israel should not, Israel must know now that they are going to have to go this alone. They're going to have to go this alone. So if if there is a straw that's going to break the camel's back, if there is a, a spark that's going to light the fire, the Middle East is a great place to do it. 
And then what that does, Eric, is it causes all these other touch points that I mentioned to light up. OK, and now's the time to take advantage of the United States of America because we are overextended. We have incredibly we have horrific debt, right, that we and China owns a lot of that debt. We have a military that is weak from 20 years of fighting a war that we ended up retreating from right in Afghanistan. And we have a massive, massive domestic problem with not only a border invasion, and, and our own drug problems with, with fentanyl. We have over 100,000 deaths from fentanyl. So we have all these things domestically, you know, and then when you look at the geostrategic stage and what's happening, the leadership inside of the White House cannot handle that level of complexity. And this is probably one of the most complex environments in my lifetime. And, and I, I'm one of these people that studies all this stuff from the tactics to the operations to the to the strategic consequences of all these things. It's been my life. This has been my life. So, so I'm, I'm concerned now. So how do we, how do we fix this? Right. And that's how, if I, if we have a minute left, I, I'd like to just say, how do we fix it? I mean, so a lot of people like, like me, I can argue and I can go to the people in Washington, DC, and I can talk to people internationally. That's what I'm going to do for most of your audience. They sit there and they go, God, what can I do? Well, you know what? Wake up your churches, wake up your communities, Wake up your local leaders, wake up your school boards, wake up everybody that matters, find leaders in your communities and tell them, demand that they stand up. Everybody in their own local communities has people that they go, you know, that guy, Eric Metaxas, he's a great guy. We ought to get him to run for office. We ought to get him to do something. And I'm just telling you, that's, that's how we, the people in this country are going to have to rise up. Because what I fear, and this is, and I do fear this, although I, you know, I always say freedom over fear, right? But I do fear that there is this, and because I, it's real, there's a wedge being driven inside of our country, and there's a desire by, by those in our government, sadly, to, to try to incite some level of violence. And we can't do that. We have to fight using the Constitution, the God-given Constitution, because it is a God-given document. Okay, if you study our Constitution, if you study our founders, if you read the, the, the various papers that were written during that time, if you read their diaries, God was at the center of everything that they wrote hey, into listen, this Constitution. It just kills me that you have to go. I'm cutting you off because I know we're both out of time. We've got to get yeah. back, you, you back on here ASAP because there's nothing more important than what you're saying. Uh, honored, uh, General Flynn, to have you folks. You can go to General Flynn. Dot com. General Flynn, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.